Our clothing communicates something. You gotta let his words be the words that determine your life, not everybody else's. Other people said you didn't belong. God says you were chosen. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, great to see you. Uh, welcome. If this is your first time here, a special welcome to you. We're glad you're here. My name's Scott. I'm one of the pastors here. And we've come to the center part of our worship service, which surrounds this book. Uh, this is the Bible. It's God's Word. And uh, we always, as we gather together, uh, are eager to listen to what it is that God wants to say to us. So I want to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 28. If this is your first Sunday here, you should just know this, that uh, we've taken up a little bit of a challenge. Um, beginning in the book of Exodus, right around chapter 25, and then all the way to the end, which is 40 chapters, all the way through Leviticus, and even to the first part of Numbers, there is a section of scriptures that's so tedious and difficult to read. And uh, if you've ever set out to try to read the Bible from cover to cover, you know that uh, you get to the end of the book of Exodus and end of Leviticus and Numbers, it just becomes so difficult to continue going. And uh, we just decided because this year's theme for our church is the word does the work, that as part of the series, we would take up some of the difficult parts of scripture to try as best we can to show the power of God's word, even in the things that we might otherwise skip over, to just slow down and uh, take a look. And I think, um, yeah, we've been at this for a number of weeks. I think this is week six, talking about the tabernacle. And um, what we've seen is that there's a picture, a very detailed picture that God wants us to see because of all the lessons that are drawn from looking at this picture. So uh, hopefully you're with me, Exodus chapter 28. Uh, the 28th chapter of the book of Exodus describes the clothing that the priests wore inside the tabernacle. So this week it's fashion week. We're gonna dig into clothing, um, which is interesting because, um, yeah, if you read through the Bible, actually, uh, I don't know, what do you picture Abraham or Isaac or Jacob or David or any of these Bible figures wearing? Uh, the Bible doesn't say very much about it. We don't know what they wore or what it looked like. Uh, maybe we do know that, you know, Jacob gave Joseph a brightly colored coat. We know that. But other than that, I mean, we really don't know what the clothing looked like. But here in chapter 28, with a ton of detail, God wants us to know what it is that the priests wore. And so we're going to take a little time looking at it. Before we read, uh, let's pray together. Lord, we're grateful to be here today. And it's good to know that you're a God who speaks. Thank you that you have spoken, us, spoken to us through your word. And... Um, yeah, today we want to read and study Exodus 28. We pray, Lord, that you help our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our minds to imagine, and then, Lord, we pray that you transform our hearts. Uh, we pray for each one of us. Uh, we ask, Lord, that you'd help us to hear your voice, and we pray for each other. Uh, Lord, help us all to hear your voice. Thank you for Jesus, for the good news of the gospel. And we ask and pray, Lord, that you will show us Jesus today. And we pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Okay, so uh, we're going to start reading in verse 1 of chapter 28. I always encourage everybody to have a Bible in front of you. Today, uh, we're going to start with a few verses, but you got to keep the Bible in front of you the entire time because we're going to keep referring to these verses. Anyway, verse 1 says, have Aaron, your brother, brought to you from among the Israelites, along with his sons, Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar, so that they may serve me as priests. Make sacred garments for your brother Aaron to give him dignity and honor. Tell all the skilled workers to whom I have given wisdom in such matters that they are to make garments for Aaron for his consecration so that he may serve me as priest. These are the garments they are to make, a breastpiece, an ephod, a robe, a woven tunic, 
a turban, and a sash. They are to make these sacred garments for your brother Aaron and his sons, so that they may serve me as priests. Have them use gold and blue and purple and scarlet yarn and fine linen. We'll just pause there for a second. I want you to just glance your eyes over this chapter. Uh, You're going to see that now there are going to be some detailed instructions about the undergarments, the tunic, the robe, the ephod, the breastpaste, the turban. And we're going to get into those details in a moment. But before we do, I want to try to help us see the big picture. So I was thinking about this, and um, hey, uh, can I just share this with you? That this Saturday, my first daughter is getting married. So that's exciting. And uh, I don't know, fathers, you've given your daughters away in marriage. I find myself just incredibly nostalgic. And so I was thinking about my oldest daughter, Marissa, all this week. And uh, I remembered uh, when she was young, maybe about second grade or so, I would take her and her sister to school. There was a little bit of a drive. And uh, we always had long conversations, but from time to time, we liked to listen to little, we tried to learn something on the way to school. And I remember that one particular day as we were going to school, we were listening to this audio about memory. And uh, the speaker was actually talking about how to remember names and facts and figures. And uh, I don't know about you, but I have this problem. You know, I'll say, oh, I'm Scott. And someone will say, oh, I'm so-and-so. And I'll take that in. And they're like, do you have this problem too? Like 10 seconds later, you're like, what's this person's name? Okay, so that's what this talk was about. Like, you know, you can hear a fact or a figure or a name or something like that, and it'll go in, but it won't stick. It won't stick. Anyway, so what the person said is, he said, here's the solution to that. If you want to start having a better memory, what you need to do is you need to create a mental picture. So he said, if someone, you know, you meet someone, and their name is Mr. Baker, you know, they maybe their name's Sean Baker, uh, If someone says, ah, I'm Sean Baker, if you just only try to remember their name, probably pretty soon you'll be doing this, you can't remember. He says, the moment they say their name is Baker, what you have to do in your mind is you have to picture that person like wearing a baker's hat and baker clothing, holding a pan of cookies, or, you know, the more elaborate the picture, the better. And then when you see the person next, you'll be like, Baker, right? Uh, That was the idea of it. Anyway, we listened to this audio, and then I thought, hmm, that's interesting. So I said, all right, uh, girls, let's see if this works. I still remember to this day the number I gave them. I said, I want you to remember this number, 5,294. And then we made up a little story, 5294. I said, okay, we're about to pull up to your school. Imagine that when we get there, There are five kids. Each of them are going to throw balls at us, uh, but only two of the balls are going to hit us, right? So you get this in your mind. There's five kids at the door of the school. They're all throwing balls, five balls, but only two are going to hit us. Now I said, now I want you to just imagine you walk in the door and... uh, At that time, Justin Bieber was like all the rage for little girls, right? So I said, imagine that Justin Bieber's at your school, uh, but he has nine pimples on his forehead. right, five, two, nine. So you see those nine pimples, and he's got a squeaky voice or whatever, but I want you to imagine that there are four girls who are just, ah, Justin Bieber, four girls. So anyway, remember that, five, two, nine, four. You got the picture in your mind, five kids throwing two, you know, two balls hit, Justin Bieber's there with nine pimples, and uh, four girls are just, ah, Justin Bieber, okay? So anyway, that's what we did, and then I dropped the kids off at school. Okay, later that day, I picked them up. I had forgotten that we'd even talked. They get in the car and they're like, Dad, five, two, nine, four. And I was like, that's right, I remember too. Anyway, I don't know. Maybe my nostalgia is more interesting to me than it is to you. <laughs> okay. But, but this was the basic concept. If you want something to get stuck in your mind, you've got to have a picture. And that is what this tabernacle, all the instructions is about. 
and uh, we're going to get a, a picture of their clothing because God just doesn't want to tell us something as a fact, a proposition, and have it quickly fade. He wants it to land and stick. I just want to start with that thought. Second thought, we're going to look into the details of these clothing in just a minute. Uh, these are the clothes of the priests. And I want to share this verse from the New Testament. It's 1 Peter 2, 9. This verse is speaking to us. And what I want you to see is that the clothing, the idea of the priests, is an advanced presentation of something that God wants us to know about us. Because look what this verse says. It says, you are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Ah, oh, there's a picture here in this verse, of course, as well. This whole light and darkness imagery. You know, in the Bible, if you're in the presence of God, there's light there. If you're away from the presence of God, that's darkness. And this whole tabernacle series is about coming into the presence of God. Uh, light is about truth. Light is about life. And as we come into the presence of God, um, that's what we have. And this, this Bible verse talks about how we were once in darkness, away from the presence of God, like people who are shut out with the walls of the tabernacle. But we've now, by God's grace, through Jesus Christ, we've transferred from the realm of darkness into his wonderful light. And as a result, it says, you're a chosen people. You're a royal priesthood. Whatever, whatever we're going to read about the priests in the Old Testament time, that was just a picture to help us understand what we now have in Christ. We're a holy nation. We're a people who belong to God because we have, through Jesus Christ, come into the presence of God. Does that make sense? All right, third thing I want to say, then we're getting into the details of uh, these pieces of clothing. And um, I just, before we talk about clothing... I want to talk about something everyone here recognizes, but just draw it to mind, that our clothing communicates something. I'm sure you know this, out of all the, the animals, all the creatures of the earth, uh, you know, dogs have fur and fish have scales and birds have feathers. We as human beings are unique in that the way we have our nakedness covered is by the clothing that we wear. And uh, I think just by itself, that's, that's special because uh, we have the ability to communicate something to the world around us through clothing. And I'll just point out that our clothes communicate something. So I'm going to show a series of pictures, and I want you to look at them and just say, what is being communicated by the clothing? So here's the first picture. All right, what do you notice about these people? Okay, you've never met one of them, have you? But I think you know something about them just by looking at them. Is that true? All right, uh, I'm going to show you another picture. Um, again, two people you've never met. Uh, they're dressed in a certain way that's quite different from the first picture I showed you. It's interesting, our clothes can communicate not only who we are, but what we do, what we do. Um, I'm going to show you another picture. Um, all right, just look at his clothing. Uh, what, what do you see? What's being communicated? Um, this person does something different than these two people did and uh, something completely different than what this group of people does. We know that, right? We, we've just looked at their clothing. Um, we know something about who we are. We know something about what we do. Human beings are interesting because uh, we actually select clothing just for certain occasions. So, of course, I couldn't leave a picture like this out this week right? Uh, we know what's going on in these two people's lives as this picture is taken. If you see someone dressed like this, you know what the occasion is, what's going on in their life. Uh, here's another picture. 
It's also clothing that's worn on occasion. Are these two people getting married right now? No, they're not. Um, our clothing not only communicates who we are, what we do, uh, what we're up to right now. Uh, I've noticed this trend that so many people are, are wearing clothing that actually has a written message on it now. Have you, have you noticed that? So uh, I found this picture. I thought that was great. <laughs> uh, I mean... So often now, uh, we're using clothing to explicitly communicate a message, but I just simply want to say that even if uh, we don't have a written message on our clothes, our clothes are communicating all kinds of things about us. And I just want to say that because as we read through the details of what these priests wore, I want you to know that there is a message that's being communicated now, I thought about how to uh, go through these details. It's actually, uh, I think, a little bit challenging. So I decided, let me first give you an artist's rendering of what the priest's clothes look like, and that'll allow us to talk through it one piece at a time. So uh, this isn't exact. I'm going to actually point out sometimes where... Uh, this picture is a little off, but at least you get some kind of idea of what's being described here in chapter 28. Now, everybody still have your Bible in front of you? I was thinking about how to uh, go through these details, and I decided that it's actually good to start at the end of the chapter and work backward just for the sake of explanation. Um, I'm sure there are reasons why... Uh, you know, as this chapter was written, it was written forwards. I'm just going to start at the end and go backwards, and you can decide if I did the right or wrong thing later. So I want to start in verse 42. So we're going to kind of go from uh, the ground up or the unclothed body getting clothed. Uh, verse 42 talks about the underwear. It says, make linen undergarments as a covering for the body reaching from the waist to the thigh. Aaron and his sons must wear them whenever they enter the tent of meeting or approach the altar to minister in the holy place so that they will not incur guilt and die. So uh, we can't see it. It's under all the other clothes. But there was, as part of the getup or part of the clothing that the priests wore there, I guess I'll just call them undergarments or underwear. You can think about a white pair of boxer shorts. I think that's a pretty good picture is from the waist down to the thigh. If you're, you know, imagine a white pair of boxer shorts, you're probably right on track. All right, now we're going to kind of work our way up. Um, you'll notice uh, that, you know, in this outfit, you can see like on the arms, there's a white, I'll, I'll call it undergarment. Uh, the Bible actually speaks about it as a, a tunic. So if you look at verse 39, this is the instruction that says, weave the tunic of fine linen and make a turban of fine linen. So you have the white, you know, the sleeves we see. You also see the turban, which is the hat on the head. The sash is to be the work of an embroiderer. Make tunics, sashes, and caps for Aaron's son to give them dignity and honor. So, yeah, what did this uh, tunic look like. You can think about kind of a robe. There would have been an opening for the head, and you can see that it had long sleeves, and then it would have been a robe that went all the way from the neck down the torso, covering the legs, kind of like a, a big robe. And uh, you'll just notice that the purpose of this garment was to give dignity and honor, and um, I'll just say this, the color of it was, was white, the undergarments and then this tunic, which would have been like a big robe that went all the way down to the ground. It was white, which I think also communicates something. This was the basic uh, garment of all the priests. They would have had like a white tunic that went to the ground. Uh, then afterward, these special clothes would have gone on the priests as they went in to minister in the sanctuary. Um, here, I want you to think about the story of the Garden of Eden. Um, God put them in the garden. He gave them trees they could eat, but there's one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You can't eat it. The day you eat it, you'll die. You know the story. Eve was tempted by the serpent. Then Adam, they ate that fruit. The moment they ate the fruit, you remember what the Bible says? They realized they were, they were naked. They were filled with shame. 
about their nakedness. I think it's a funny part of the Bible. What was that like? They've been naked their whole life and then all of a sudden they're like, <gasps> we're naked. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I just like to try to imagine that moment. But clearly they were overcome with a sense of guilt and shame. And as the third chapter of Genesis concludes, we're told that although they tried to cover themselves with fig leaves, what God did is he made a garment from animal skins and covered their, their shame. Um, you know, this was all about guilt and shame. But now I want you to notice, what does the color white, what does that say about a person? Why do, why do you know, brides wear white on their wedding day? It speaks about their purity, their holiness, their goodness, their rightness. And, um, you know, the first time we read about clothing in the Old Testament, it's all about guilt and shame. But I just want you to notice that as people are coming back into the presence of God, God's clothing them with white, and he says it's for their dignity and honor. Okay, so that's the, the tunic. Now we're going to keep working our way back. Um, I want you now to take a look. There's that, see on, see on this priest, there's this blue robe. I want you to see that next. So let's go back to verse 31. It says, make the robe of the ephod entirely of blue cloth with an opening for the head in its center. There shall be a woven edge like a collar around this opening so that it will not tear. Make pomegranates of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn around the hem of the robe with gold bells between them. Um, okay, so uh, there was this blue, okay, over the tunic, there was this blue robe that went down, and uh, it went all the way down to the ground, and then kind of sewn into them, uh, it, they alternated, there were bells, and then there were called pomegranates, like a little fruit. Anyway, let's talk about the details one at a time. Uh, this robe was blue, now, the Bible doesn't tell us why. Uh, people kind of take a guess at it. What does blue communicate? Well, there's some people who say, okay, it was probably blue because it was connected to heaven. After all, when you look up at the sky, what color do you see? Blue. Other people say, well, it was probably blue because it designated majesty or royalty. You know, to dye a cloth blue, especially in those times, was a not an easy task. It's only those who have royalty or just extreme dignity that would have that kind of color. And so, I mean, if you're somebody who could put on a blue robe, uh, you were somebody. You were somebody special. And so, whether, it, whether it's connected to heaven or whether it's connected to majesty or royalty, uh, something was being communicated when you saw a person just in a striking blue Garment. Now, I want to talk about the, the bells and the pomegranates. Let me start with the bells. I just happen to have this sitting here. Um, I want you to imagine that as a person was walking, there were all kinds of bells, and they were, they were kind of at the bottom of the garment. So let me just do this here a little bit. All right. All uh, right. Did you notice anyone else wearing bells today? Okay, if someone was wearing bells, would you have noticed? Yes. You couldn't help but notice if someone has this on their clothing, um, you would be forced to take notice. Oh, who's that person? <laughs> Why are they wearing bells? I mean, it would have just called attention. So here you are in this royal, majestic, heavenly blue robe, and uh, you don't only just see it, you hear it when they move. That's somebody. Um, you know, some, somebody special. Something's going on there. Also, and, and it was alternating, there was bells and there was pomegranates. Now, we don't eat that many pomegranates. I mean, some of us will eat the, the seeds. You know about the seeds. Uh, Pomegranates are, are very common in the Middle East. And uh, one of the reasons probably that, you know, this was the imagery here is that if you were to just slice up a pomegranate, you'll just see that the inside, the fruit is just chock full of seeds. 
And uh, that's what pomegranates are known for, just all the, the potential and the, the scenes and its ability to reproduce itself. And I think the symbolism was, was just that. Um, when this was a person walking, I, I'll put it this way, this was a person that mattered. Their life made a difference. Wherever they went, it was like they're sowing seeds for the future. Wherever they went, there's like multiplication happening all around them. Uh, this is a person that has got a tremendous potential and someone who's making a difference in the world. And I, th I think that's a symbolism of the pomegranates. Just a person whose life is very fruitful. Someone who, who's important and is really, their life is making a difference. Everywhere they walk, everywhere they go, uh, Things are sprouting up and changing all around them. That, I think, is what's being communicated there. Okay, uh, next thing I want to talk about is, is a part of a garments we might not know that much about called an ephod. Um, who's got an ephod on today? Okay, <laughs> none of us. Uh, uh, what, what was an ephod? Well, I want you to picture an apron uh, that would be put on backwards. So usually we put on aprons and then we tie it in the back. An ephod would have been much like an apron, but it would have come around and been tied in the front. And I guess you can see it there on the picture. Uh, look with me beginning in verse 6. It says, make an ephod of gold and of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and of finely twisted linen, the work of a skilled hands. It is to have two shoulder peaches attached to two of its corners so that it can be fastened. Its skillfully woven waistband is to be like it, of one piece with the ephod and made with gold and with blue, purple, and scarlet yarn and with finely twisted linen. Okay, let's just stop for a minute. So you've got this apron. What's it made of? Uh, blue, purple, scarlet yarn, and then it also says of gold. And here we're not to think of like gold yarn. We're to think of gold, so uh, the idea of this gold is actually it would have been melted down and put in this really thin plate and then a very skilled craftsman would actually cut threads of that gold so that the gold itself was woven into the ephod, uh, this sort of backwards apron. Okay, um, if you're wearing gold-plated clothes, what's that say about you? I mean, uh, okay. Anyone here in PSL walk around wearing gold-plated clothes? Okay, you ain't from the pizzle if you're wearing, I mean, this is somebody. I mean, if someone, their, their clothing is made with gold threads, it says something about who they are and how special they are. And anyway... I just want you to think, I mean, as we're building this picture of this priest from the white linens to the blue robe and now this, you know, brightly colored ephod that's uh, woven together with actual gold. Uh, hopefully you're getting this into your mind. Now, the next thing I, I want to talk about is the breast piece. So uh, you can see kind of a representation there. Let's start reading in verse uh, 15. It says, fashion a breast piece for making decisions, the work of skilled hands. Make it like the ephod of gold and of blue, purple and scarlet yarn, and of finely twisted linen. It is to be squared, a span long and a span wide, and folded double. So, you know, a span is the distance of a hand, so you can kind of think about what that looks like. Uh, then mount four rows of precious stones on it. The first row shall be carnelian, chrysolite, and beryl. The second row shall be turquoise, lapis lazuli, and emerald. The third row shall be jacinth, agate, and amethyst. The fourth row shall be topaz, onyx, and jasper. Mount them in gold filigree settings. There are to be 12 stones, one for each of the names of the sons of Israel, each engraved like a seal with the name of one of the 12 tribes. Then it says in verse 22, for the breast piece, make braided chains of pure gold like a rope. And um, anyway, I'll just pause there. Okay, this is something. I mean, you got the gold plated clothes, but this is really, I mean, okay, you've got these 12 precious stones. 
And um, okay, I got weddings on my mind. So you just think about, you know, a groom gives to a bride uh, a diamond. And you can think about like, you know, all the bridesmaids come around and like if the, if the diamond's really big, like, ooh. But now we've, now we've got precious stones. I mean, these are gigantic stones. I mean, the worth of this breastplate, I mean, it must have been amazing. I mean, here it is, and you've got this gold chain uh, made out of pure gold that it's, okay, when you see a person and they're wearing like a gold chain, I don't mean just like a small gold chain. Anybody got like a chain on? Come on, who's got a chain on? Okay, I see some, thank you. I, I mean, that says something, but if you've got like a massive gold chain and then underneath you've got like precious stones, I, I'm getting ready for the wedding and all the girls are talking about what jewelry they're going, this is jewelry. Okay, so again, um, I want you to think about the, the value, the dignity, the honor that is being conveyed, right? There's a message by this set of clothing. Now, it says that on each stone was one of the names of the 12 tribes. And I'd like to just do this for a second, which I want to point out that on their shoulders, it's, it's missing uh, in this picture, I think. But uh, look at verse 9. It says, take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel in the order of their birth, six, na six names on one stone and the remaining six on the other. Engrave the names of the sons of Israel on the two stones the way a gem cutter engraves a seal. Then mount the stones in gold filigree settings and fashion them on the shoulder pieces of the ephod as memorial stones for the sons of Israel. Um, so here's the idea that on each shoulder there was an expensive onyx stone also engraved with the names of each of the 12 tribes because this priest was going to come into the presence of God and was going to represent all the people. Just make a quick comment, then we're going to move on. Uh, at Christmas, almost every Christmas, uh, you'll hear a reading of Isaiah chapter 9. For unto us a son is born, unto us a child has been given. And it says, and the government shall be on his shoulders. He'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Everlasting Father, uh, Prince of Peace. And the increase of government, there'll be no end. But the government shall be on his shoulders. The idea, of course, this is talking about the coming of Jesus, is that Jesus was the one who was going to shoulder all the burdens of his people and enter into the presence of God. He, he's got our names written on his heart. He's bearing our burdens on his shoulders. And he's the one who's going to enter the presence of God on our behalf so that we can follow in after him. And uh, this Christmas, I just want you you know, to remember that when you think about the government shall be on his shoulders because you'll almost certainly hear that verse and just think about what it, Jesus has got our names on his heart and he's got our names and our burdens and our problems on, our, on his shoulders and he's going to enter in on our behalf into the very presence of God um, as our high priest. Anyway, uh, one more thing. A lot of details. I just want to show one more detail. And uh, that is that there was a plate that went across the forehead. Uh, you can't really see it too well on this picture either. But I, verse 36 says, Make a plate of pure gold and engrave on it as a seal, holy to the Lord. Fasten a blue cord to it to attach it to the turban. It is to be on the front of the turban. It'll be on Aaron's forehead, and he will bear the guilt involved in the sacred gifts of the, Israel, uh, the Israelites consecrate, whatever their gifts may be. So I just want you to picture this. There was a gold plate, and right across the top, it said, holy to the Lord. And let me just say, um, already, this wearing gold-plated clothes. He's got all these expensive jewels with a big gold chain, uh, wearing white and blue. Uh, this was no ordinary person. The moment you would have seen them, you'd, you'd heard them because the bells are ringing, you would have been like, wow. Okay, but then there was this gold plate that said, holy to the Lord. Um, I've talked about this before. Uh, the word holy, I think, we don't use it too much in everyday language, so it's difficult to get the meaning. The word holy just simply means this, to be set apart. 
And uh, every time I talk about this, I try to do it in a little bit different way. So uh, here, here's the stage. It's sort of, you've been looking at it all day. But okay, the word holy to be set apart means something like special or extraordinary. The opposite of holy is common or ordinary. So if you want to make something holy, what you do is you set it apart. So I just thought I'd do this. Uh, here's one part of what's here up on stage. I'm just taking Saron's microphone. I hope that's okay. I'll put it back, Saron. Um, now I'm holding, look at this. All right, the whole service went by. Uh, probably you never keyed into this, but because I've now set it apart, it's not just the backdrop anymore. I've pulled it out. I've set it apart. Now our attention's on it. Uh, everything else is ordinary or common. There's something special or unique or extraordinary that is this thing. And uh, that's what it means to be holy. Okay, we have our common everyday life. And if God makes us holy, what he's done is he's like set us apart from everything else. He sort of elevated us and put us on a stand and like, this is what's unique. Pay attention to this. This is what's special. Anyway, just point out that this priest had... Okay, I'm going to put this back. Had this gold plate and it said, holy to the Lord engraved upon it. So you have the picture, right? Uh, these are the details that we just worked through. And what we've seen is this is no common, ordinary person. The clothing communicated something. All right, I want to come back to this verse. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So uh, this is speaking of Christians. We've been called out of darkness. We've been brought into the presence of God and there's light. And as a result, we're not just nobodies. We're a chosen people. We are a royal priesthood. So, I know we don't all always feel like that, and I just guess to myself that in this room, there are people their entire lives who've been struggling almost at a base level with even things like acceptance. It might have started with your parents. You just never felt like you were fully accepted. Um, you brought home C's and they said, why didn't you bring home B's? You brought home B's and they said, why didn't you bring home A's? You brought home A's and they said, why was the percentage only a 95? Um, and you just started struggling with, well, how do I get accepted? Uh, some of us I know had worse. We maybe even had parents who were like, hey, you're good for nothing. You'll never amount to anything. I know that some of us who are sitting here today had words like that spoken about us. And so all through our life, we've been struggling with this idea of, man, I'm a nobody, I'm not accepted. Um, some of us, uh, we can remember this all too well. It, it was in school and it was time to pick teams and there were two chosen captains and they would pick people one at a time and uh, we'd always be at the end. And because we're always at the end, we just struggled with this idea of where do I belong? How do I get accepted? Uh, we tried to find groups and we tried to fit in. Some of us wore clothing that didn't even fit and looked ridiculous just to try to get people to let us be part of their group. And uh, we just never felt like we, we belonged or, you know. Uh, there's some of us that have just been struggling with that all our lives. There's people who have rejected us. There's people who have put us down. There's people who have spoken words over us. And uh, okay, today, if you belong to Jesus, if Jesus has brought you out of darkness into his light, if Jesus has laid down his life for you, if you belong to him, uh, you gotta let his words be the words that determine your life, not everybody else's. Okay, other people said you didn't belong. God says you were chosen. Other people didn't pick you for the team. He said, I choose you. People said, there's nothing special about you. And Jesus is like, you're the most special there is. You're part of the royal priesthood. And I know we didn't dress up like it today, but you gotta kinda, I think, throw your shoulders back, pick up your head and be like, wow, 
I am one of the special people who would put on these gold-plated clothes, who'd walk around with a pure gold plate on my head that said, I'm special, I'm unique, I'm extraordinary. And I'm just saying this, um, it doesn't matter what other people said. If the God of the universe looks down at you and says, you are somebody special, You know, everywhere you walk, it's ringing because you're not an ordinary person. You're an extraordinary person. Everywhere you walk, there's these little pomegranates that are waving around. Your life matters. It makes a difference. You're sowing seed wherever you go. And if you belong to Jesus, I just, I thought it was important to just pause and uh, just take it in. We got to let go of what other people said as we listen to what the God of the universe says about us if we belong to Jesus. And uh, I can't conclude without uh, saying one more thing, which is I already talked about how, you know, Isaiah chapter nine talks about those stones that Jesus, you know, took on our burdens, that he holds our name close to our heart. Jesus is the high priest. He came to do the most special thing, which is bring salvation. We who were filled with guilt and shame, we were wallowing in darkness, being brought into the light. And I I think I'm just going to come stand by the cross as I say what I say next. I want you to think about the story of Jesus' crucifixion. In all the gospels, remember there's this line, They divided his clothing by casting lots. Which means that as Jesus was hanging on the cross, what was he wearing? What was he wearing? Nothing. He was naked. His clothing, his dignity was stripped off of him. As he hung there on the cross naked, there were people who were mocking him, degrading him. He was bearing our burdens. Our name was on, why did Jesus, our name was over his heart. Our problems were on his shoulders and he was stripped naked, mocked and uh, made completely undignified so that, so that we can wear the robes of Christ. And you know, that's what the Bible says that we've been given new clothes, the clothes of Christ, full of his righteousness. And uh, we matter, we belong, we are someone. And it was because of what Jesus did that if you belong to him, you are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You're a people belonging to God. You've been brought out of darkness into his wonderful light that you might declare his praises. And uh, I just hope today we're gonna shirk off every other understanding of ourselves, throw back our shoulders, thank God for what he's done in Jesus and worship and praise him uh, like we never have before. So let me close and then we're gonna get on with the praising. Let's pray.